Okay, today uh, we're going to finish up this chapter 5 talking about uh, transport, basically uh, diffusion and resistivity processes. But in particular, what I want to talk about today is some specialized things that happen in a fully ionized plasma as opposed to one with neutrals in it. Because in a fully ionized plasma, you have the situation that um, the momentum exchange between the electrons and ions is reversible. That is to say, momentum lost from the electrons goes into the ions and, and so forth. So anyway, we'll talk about that in a moment. Anyway, so the idea is transport in a uh, fully ionized, and what we frankly mean by that word fully ionized is that the neutral collision frequency is much less than the Coulomb collision frequencies, um, and magnetized, and you remember magnetized meant that um, our omega C tau is much less than one, or alternatively, the collision frequency over omega C is much less than one. Um, so plasma with Coulomb collisions. And we're going to take for simplicity uh, temperature equals constant, uh, spatially constant, and so therefore grad pressure is equal to T grad N. So uh, basically, remember to do transport equations, or at least I'm going to do them in a sort of fluid way, uh, so you'll see how this goes. Uh, we have uh, an equation dN dt plus del dot NV, so that would be our density continuity equation. If you look at it as a transport equation, the question becomes, what is the particle flux NV? And how do we solve for that particle flux? Well, what we have to do is we go to the uh, momentum balance equation and try to solve it somehow or other, next moment equation, uh, for the flow velocity. So NQE plus V cross B um, minus T grad N. This is grad pressure. But then I want to add one other thing, which is often called R, and this is the collisional friction force. And that's the part that's going to be different or special because of Coulomb uh, collisions today. And, oh, and we're going to want uh, to do equilibrium, okay? So we can always, and what we really mean by this is a transport equilibrium, and so the flows aren't changing very rapidly. They're supposed to be more or less um, steady um, uh, type flows. Okay, we need to look at this collisional friction force, and basically what it is, if it was for the electrons, let's say, um, and in particular for collisions on ions, it would just be a relaxation of the flow because of collisions. So it would be Me, Ne, Nu E times Ve minus Vi. And again, I have to have the Ve minus Vi partially to make the equation Galilean invariant. That's one thing. But really, the reason why I have to have it is because if the ions are flowing, I only have a, a friction by the difference from the electron to the ion flow velocity. Now, the important thing uh, is, however, that this is equal to minus Rie. And what that means is momentum lost by collisions from the electrons is gained by collisions in the ions. Um, now, you remember, uh, and, and well, and if I wanted, you know, I'd just have a plus sign there. Now, I'd like to write this in a little bit different way, partially so I see Ohm's law a lot easier. And to do that, what we want to do is note that uh, the electrical conductivity we found was N sub E, e squared over Me nu E. And so I could convert that into a formula for the electron collision frequency. Namely, the electron collision frequency is then N sub E E squared over M sub E times the electrical conductivity. If I do that, then I can reform this electron ion momentum transfer or friction uh, 
as minus M E N E, and now instead of nu E, I put in N sub E E squared over M E sigma. And I should have said for the electron minus ion flow velocity, since the current is equal to N sub E E V I minus V E, I can again invert that one and say that V I minus V E, sorry, V E minus V I, which is what I have in this collisional frictional form, is equal to the current density divided by N sub E E but with a minus sign. It may not be all that apparent that there's a minus sign there. So uh, that's minus J uh, vector over N sub E E. And now we'll cancel a few things here. One power of N sub E, one power of um, the charge E, um, and one power of the mass, I guess. So, and overall it becomes plus N sub E E uh, J over sigma. And in this form, um, well, in general then we can write that the friction, whether it's for electrons or ions, is minus N Q J over sigma. Now, if you just <clears throat> look at this result back in terms of the momentum balance equation and imagine you know, taking the components only along the magnetic field and ignoring the pressure gradient or density gradient, then I would just have the friction term, which would be NQJ over sigma, and the electric field, NQE. And so if I just equate those two, I get good old Ohm's law, J is equal to sigma E. So it's convenient to write it in this particular form. Um, okay, but I really want to do something else. Um, what we really want to do when we say transport, I should have perhaps said, is perpendicular transport. That is to say, transport perpendicular to magnetic field lines. And so what I somehow need to do is to determine the perpendicular transport uh, from this equation. And in particular, I'm interested in the transport in the direction of grad N. Okay, sort of, you know, what's the flow? I'd like to write this flow as a minus D grad N. Okay, and so the question is, what is the flow and does it look like, a, does it look like that? And it will. So let's uh, start calculating then. What we need to do is take this equilibrium momentum balance equation and extract somehow from it the perpendicular flow velocity. And how do we extract the perpendicular flow velocity? Well, we always cross it, okay? So B cross the uh, equilibrium momentum balance. And I won't go through this. We've become veterans of this, so I won't do it again. But in general, what you find is you have an E cross B flow. And notice that now, again, this is now the macroscopic flow. It's not the individual particle flow. So all particles happen to be E cross B drifting, but also the fluid as a whole, E cross B drifts. And then we have the diamagnetic flow, B cross grad P. That's from that term, which I've now written back as grad P, I guess. And that's over N Q B squared. And then you remember that any force that I have in this equation, when I cross it, I will get a, a term like this grad P over NQB squared. But now I add the collisional friction force, and we get that friction force cross B divided by B squared. Now, previously, when we've talked about flow velocities, we've only talked about this E cross B flow velocity and the diamagnetic flow velocity. And these are, in some sense, then, what I'm going to call lowest order. Um, what about this last term? Why have we neglected it? Well, it comes back to this low collision frequency compared to gyro motion type of limit. Let's try to look. Oh, I'm sorry. I need an NQ in the denominator here. <coughs> 
let's look at the magnitude of this term. Um, and remember that the friction force, just don't, don't worry about the directions for a moment. The friction force was minus uh, Me, Ne, Nu E times sort of V perp. You know, our R cross will get a V perp out of that. And then this gets divided by N E B squared. And that's surely an N E, and I won't, won't worry about signs here and so forth. So that cancels. Um, oh, I'm sorry, and there's a B upstairs, so the B cancels as well. So what this turns out to be is then collision frequency. Then let me write it as E B in a suggestive form, E B over M E and then times V perp. So this is nu E over omega C E. Uh, but remember we said we wanted a large omega C tau plasma, many gyro periods per collision, weak collision, collisions, so this is much less than one. So in other words, these are the lowest order flows. These are in some sense of order unity. Uh, and whereas these collision-induced flows are higher order or, or somewhat smaller. Now, formally when you go through this, the E cross B drifts and so forth are usually ordered one order small in the gyro radius. So what people usually write this as is V perp is equal to V perp 1, where that's all of these, the diamagnetic and E cross B flows. And then uh, the second one is V perp 2, which is this collisional friction induced flow. Um, now, what? let's look at this perpendicular flow. Let's not worry about the E cross B for a moment. Maybe even I have a plasma with no electric field in it. What about the diamagnetic one? Well, we, you know, the uh, question is, can I stick that back in here and obtain some net transport? Is that what I was looking for? At least it has a grad N in it, okay? Well, if you kind of look back at this, um, what you find, let's uh, we sort of now will specialize to a slab model for a moment. So imagine that I have some slab model here, and I have, as usual, the magnetic field in the uh, in the z direction, and and then I have x and y, and I will um, put myself a density gradient in here, uh, n of x, and so grad n is in this direction, and which direction is this flow uh, B cross grad P? Well, it is, of course, the diamagnetic flow, so it's going to be uh, in the Y direction, so it's V diamagnetic is proportional to Y hat. So this is then not what we were looking for, which what we were looking for was a particle flux in the same direction as grad N. Okay, so this is not it. And frankly, if you take the divergence of this flow, it's in fact zero in a slab model. So you can actually show that divergence of V perp 1 with, if you make the electric field electrostatic as well, is equal to zero uh, in a slab model. It gets a little more complicated in a very complicated magnetic geometries, but that's not really important for us at the moment. Okay, so in some sense, in order to get the flow that's causing transport or indicative of transport, apparently we need to calculate something other than this lowest order flow, and since it's collision-induced transport we're interested in, we can guess that it may be coming out of there. Now, to calculate that term, since this is a lower order term, we can do a sort of iteration. We can say, well, I need a perpendicular flow velocity to go into here. What will I use for that? Well, I'll use the lowest order flows, you know, and I'll just kind of iterate on the equation here. You can set up a formal ordering analysis, but it's equivalent to doing what, doing what I just said. So let's estimate um, then, well, first what we need to do is we need to estimate the, uh, the friction term. 
frictional force, actually. And it's, it's this frictional force is equal to minus NQV over, uh, or sorry, J over sigma. And for J, what I'll do is I'll take J as the sum over species of NQV. And I'm only going to be interested, it turns out, in the perpendicular parts because I have B cross this. And what did I find for the lowest order V perp? Well, what I found was, of course, that we had our E cross B drift. And then I also, we also had our diamagnetic drift, B cross grad P over NQ B squared. Now, how much current is caused by the E cross B drifts? How about none? Because the, sum, because the E cross B drifts are the same for both species. They both move, ions and electrons move together. And by charge neutrality, sum over NQ is zero. So there's no net charge imbalance from that. On the other hand, the NQ here cancels that NQ there. And so what I find is my perpendicular current is in fact B cross the gradient of the sum over pressures over the species divided by B squared. Or we can write this as then B cross gradient of PE plus PI divided by B squared. Or since we took T equals constant, we can make this B cross uh, Te plus Ti gradient of N, all divided by B squared. Okay, so with this in mind, then we can write that our perpendicular uh, frictional force is given by just minus NQ over sigma and then J perp, and I just figured out that the J perp was only the diamagnetic current. And I'll leave it back in this form here with the two pressures in it. So it's B cross gradient of PE plus PI divided by B squared. Okay, now what we wanted to calculate was the collisional, uh, was the, this is a frictional force, and given that there is this force, how much net transport does it cause? How much net flow in the direction of grad P, we hope? And that was our, what you might call, our second order flow. Um, so let's talk about that, namely our V perp second order in gyro radius, which is not so obvious why, um, is equal to frictional force perp cross B over B squared. And we had previously here um, that our frictional force was that. Uh, and it has a minus sign, so let's just you know, flip the order and put it in and so forth. So what we get is then uh, NQ over sigma I'm sorry, I need an NQ here. That's the reason why I'm wondering about it. Uh, so the factor comes out, and the 1 over NQ, and now I've got a to in total B to the fourth power. And then the minus B, uh, B cross, and that cross B, I can invert the order, and if you work all that out, it just becomes B cross B cross gradient of PE plus PI, total pressure, ions plus electrons. And now, uh, of course, we've done everything right. A few things cancel out. What is this quantity here? Uh, you remember we've been doing B cross B crosses for a long time, and this is just minus B squared del perp of <coughs> PE plus PI. So now we're indeed finding a flow velocity proportional to the gradient of the pressure or density in the direction we're interested in. And so you kind of stick all this together. The B squared cancels the B to the fourth. And you end up with minus 1 over sigma. Uh, that's the electrical conductivity. 
uh, b squared times the gradient perp of uh, PE plus PI. So then in answer to the question which we had, which was that the particle flux was equal to NV, and now it's NV perp 1 plus V perp 2, uh, the V perp 1 was sort of not interesting to us, so well, this just goes over to N uh, V perp 2. Uh, and what we then find is that this is, um, using this V perp 2, this is equal to minus uh, N, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I need to multiply by N, so yeah. N uh, sigma uh, B squared Um, gradient uh, PE plus PI. I seem to be setting myself up for an extra term here. Um, where, oh, where? Well, anyway, th th that doesn't belong there is the basic problem. <laughs> anyway, this becomes then uh, minus uh, D perp grad N. And what we then identify is that D perp is equal to, uh, since I should have written this out as TE plus TI times the density gradient, um, then I can just identify that D perp is TE plus TI over the electrical conductivity times B squared. Is that what I expected from my, uh, from some sort of simple-minded argument? Well, again, let's go back to uh, what, would, what would we anticipate, expected, uh, diffusion coefficient. <laughs> Namely, what we would expect is, uh, again, our, by our random walk, walk argument, d is delta x squared over delta t, and for collisional gyro motion perpendicular to field lines, the delta x is proportional to sort of the gyro radius. And delta t, I uh, should say 1 over delta t, is about nu. So what we would have expected is collision frequency, some gyro radius. And what did we get? Well, what we found was that d perp was equal to, um, I'm sorry, te plus ti um, divided by sigma b squared, and perhaps I ought to put in a sigma perp. And now I see from my notes that indeed I should have had an N in here. So we'll stick it back in there. Um, it's because I needed to cancel out the one that's in the sigma, it turns out. <laughs> um, okay, so stick that back in. And uh, so is this the same as that, is the basic question. Well, let's write back in what the electrical conductivity is. Uh, and so we get NE times TE plus TI. The electrical conductivity was N sub E E squared over M sub E nu E. Uh, and then we have this uh, 1 over B squared. Still got a little bit to do. And here's the density I needed to cancel that one. Uh, we got an overall collision frequency here indeed. So that works out. Um, TE plus TI is a little awkward. So what we'll do is we'll make it TE plus TI over 2TE. And then what we're left with, uh, we can see an E squared, B squared. Now I could sneak this into a cyclotron frequency if I'd add an electron mass squared upstairs. But I only had one, so I better put one downstairs. <laughs> 
And then I sneaked in a 2TE over here, so I better put that back up over there. So the net result is this is 1 over omega CE squared, and this is V thermal E squared, and the combination is then electron gyro radius squared. So indeed what we find is that we get nu sub E times rho E squared times TE plus TI all over 2 TE. So indeed, we got what we thought we'd get, new row squared, but we got a modifying factor here that says, well, it's TE plus TI that comes in. Now, there's a couple other things that's kind of, kind of interesting here. Um, which did I do this calculation for? That is to say, this particle flux, I calculated uh, V perp to the gamma. Did I do it for ions or electrons? I actually did it in such a way that it's exactly the same, okay? Because if you go back, I said I had a friction force cross B over NQ, and then I wrote the friction force such that it'd be valid for either species. And so what this is saying is the particle diffusion coefficient is the same for ions and electrons. And why is that? Well, what this particle diffusion is coming about, or this diffusive flow is coming about from, is the frictional force between the diamagnetic flows of the ions and electrons, which are in opposite directions. Okay, the diamagnetic flow of the ions is minus y, and the diamagnetic flow of the electrons is plus y. And then you just add them together. Well, I'm sorry, then they're pulling apart, and the collisional friction on those flows, this is the fluid way of looking at transport, the collisional friction on those flows uh, gives you the net diffusive transport. Now, it's equal and opposite, or because the frictional force, okay, is equal and opposite for electrons and ions, whatever momentum I lose from one species goes to the other, then, and this is 1 over Q, a sine Q, you know, Q is equal to plus or minus, this in fact then says that R perp over Q is a constant, is a, is a number. And so that means that this V perp is the same for both species. And... What that is often called is an automatically ambipolar process, okay? So this is equal to D perp electron is equal to D perp ion, and this is an, what's called an intrinsically. Intrinsically means, you know, it's always that way, and because of the conservation of momentum property in the, in the collisional friction, intrinsically uh, ambipolar transport. I don't have to, there's no electric field that I had to determine to, to do that, to, to determine this cross-field transport, whereas you remember when I had neutrals, I did have to worry about that sort of thing. So this is intrinsically uh, ambipolar transport. Now, if I had just used my little argument here of expected diffusion coefficient, delta x squared over delta t, it turns out, in that case, I would not necessarily have known that it was intrinsically ambipolar. Um, you have to physically think through the process to, in order to show that, that in fact um, the, uh, well, in fact the um, electron ion collisions are the only ones that give rise to net particle transport across field lines. Because if I have electron-electron collisions, I just exchange two electrons and I don't actually transport charge, you know, I just sit there. Uh, so I have to, uh, I just exchange two electrons, but then if I paint one red and one yellow, well, I'll know which ones they were, but otherwise, afterwards, I won't know what happened. Uh, you know, I just exchange the electrons. Similarly with ion-ion collision. So you have to have electron-ion, or, or the, the, and remember, this electron collision frequency is, in fact, the electron-ion collision frequency. Um, I want to come back to that in a little bit, but before I do that, I want to mention one other thing, which is let's uh, again go back to our random walk arguments and, and distinguish what happens along magnetic fields versus what happens perpendicular to magnetic fields. So what we would have is parallel to B, that the parallel... Um, you know, diffusivity, uh, 
will be a delta z squared over delta t, and the delta z uh, would be of order lambda, and 1 over delta t would be of order nu, and so what we find is that d parallel is nu lambda squared, and that's of order v thermal squared over nu, if you use the fact that lambda itself is just v thermal over nu. But on the other hand, perpendicular to b, we have that d perp is of order, you know, delta x squared over delta t. Delta x is of order gyro radius. 1 over delta t is of order nu. And so we get d perp is of order nu rho squared. Now, what I'd next like to do is discuss a little bit what happens uh, on electrons versus ions. Okay, these are sort of scaling relationships. But the comment is that electrons and ions do different things because the electrons have, you know, they have much higher thermal velocity for about the same temperature. So let's uh, sort of talk about that a little bit. Um, so let's call this electron versus ion diffusion. And I should say this is for Te of order Ti, well, you know, within an order of magnitude or so, uh, so that I don't get way off here. And what I want to do is talk about, you know, these sorts of which is bigger, electron diffusion parallel or ion diffusion parallel or electron diffusion perpendicular or ion diffusion perpendicular, something or other. Now, to do that, to, to discuss that, I need to have something to tell me about what happens here for the uh, typical ratios between the collision frequencies of electrons, collision frequencies of ions, and so forth. Well, we haven't gone through that in detail, but let me just tell you how that works out. Um, of course, we know that the ion thermal velocity is of order uh, Me over Mi V thermal E, which is much less than 1, because the ions are more massive at a given temperature. They don't have as high a thermal velocity. Uh, I'm sorry, much less than V thermal E. Similarly, it turns out because the ions are mo more massive, their ion collision frequency turns out to be of order Me over Mi times nu E, hence much slower collision rate than electrons. Electrons are moving real fast. They collide real fast. What about the mean free path of the ions? Well, that's, of course, V thermal ion over nu I. How does that compare to V thermal E over nu E? Well, it turns out if the temperatures are about equal, they're about the same. So the mean free paths turn out to be about the same. How about the gyro radii? Gyro radii of the ions would be, you know, V thermal ion over omega ci. How big is that? Well, V thermal ion is, of course, 1 over the square root of the ion mass ratio. So this is kind of small compared to the thermal speed. But the ion cyclotron frequency is a full mass ratio smaller. So it turns out this is of order Mi over Me, rho E, much greater than um, rho E. So this is the kinds of inequalities we have to deal with. And the basic story is, of course, that electrons run real fast and collide fast, but they have small gyro radii. Ions are slow, but they have big gyro radii. So let's then ask the question, what is the ratio of parallel electron diffusion to parallel ion diffusion? And that would be of the order of nu e lambda e squared divided by nu e nu i lambda i squared. And the mean free paths, collisional mean free paths of electrons and ions are about equal. So I'm left only with the ratio of the electron to ion um, collisional mean free paths, uh, collision, collisions, okay? Uh, and that we just determined up here was of order Me over Mi, much less than 1. I'm sorry, <laughs> the other way around. Mi over Me and much greater than 1.
So the electrons diffuse much more rapidly along field lines than the ions. But what happens? Well, we already solved that problem, and um, what happens is electrons tend to diffuse more rapidly, diffuse parallel to B rapidly, but this uh, leads to an electric field um, to slow the electrons down, a self-consistent ambipolar electric field to slow down to the um, uh, ion rate. So the intrinsic or you know just free flow would give you a much ra more rapid electron diffusion rate, but the electric self-consistent or ambipolar electric field builds up so as to bring it back down to uh, the ion flow rate. Okay, what about the perpendicular, d perp e to d perp i? Well, if I use again my little scaling argument, this would be nu e rho e squared over nu i rho i squared. And the ratio of the electron to ion collision frequency is a mi over me square root. But the ratio of the gyro radii is in the opposite way, namely me over mi, and square rooted, square squared, so it comes back to that. And so this becomes ultimately a square root of me over mi, much less than 1. But here, I'm being fallacious, really, in writing this down, namely the d perp ion, because what we really found, not from this sort of random walk type argument, but rather from uh, the fluid type argument that took account of momentum conservation in collisions, and hence had an automatically intrinsically ambipolar process, that in fact um, what we had was d perp i uh, equals d perp e, irrespective of the electric field because of intrinsic ambipolarity. But the meaningfulness of this comment is then that suppose I had not d's, but I had chi perps, okay? Of course, chi is thermal diffusivities, okay? Thermal heat diffusivities. Not heat conduction, because that includes a density, but in the same units. Well, you could do that, but anyway. Um, so thermal diffusivities. Um, but so therefore, what you do have is that uh, chi perp I is much larger than chi perp E. And so chi perp I as of order nu I rho I squared is much greater than and D and chi, D perp and chi perp are about the same. And so this is much greater than D perp E of order chi perp E. So what I'm kind of trying to get to in all this is that first off the electrons, you know, in the fastest thing happening the electrons try to diffuse parallel to the magnetic field, or run, you know, uh, free flow and diffuse. And then uh, an electric field builds up and holds them back in, slows them down to the ion flow. <clears throat> On the other hand, perpendicular to the field line, electrons and ions diffuse equally by classical Coulomb collisions. Uh, and, but then the dominant perpendicular transport process is not actually perpendicular particle diffusion of electrons or perpendicular heat diffusion of the electrons, but rather by square root of mass ratio, the dominant one is slow moving ions, slow moving but big gyro radii. So this is actually the dominant perpendicular process uh, in a magnetized plasma, at least from a so called classical basis. Okay, now uh, just to finish up a couple more things on transport and diffusion here then. So um, let's call this transport processes and this is more about language. <laughs> um, it turns out 
that what we have been talking about is what's often called classical diffusion. So let's, uh, let me do some processes. So we get classical diffusion. And what that is, uh, is d perp is of order, uh, you know, new rho squared with delta x of order rho and 1 over delta t of order nu. And what that means is um, Coulomb collisions plus gyro motion. leads to transport. Now there's generically another type of, of transport which is usually called neoclassical diffusion. At one time there was also paleoclassical and neoclassical suggested in various things but those didn't hold so neoclassical is the only one that held. And basically there D perp is of order some delta x perp drift uh, squared over delta t, uh, or times collision frequency, let's say, where this delta x perp d is of order of the drift off the flux surface, and 1 over delta t is some new effective. Um, and the idea here is this is Coulomb collisions on the drifting orbits, drift orbits whereby, you know, we can drift off of flux surfaces, and this gives you transport as well. And that's a, a large subject which we go into in 725 and so forth. You have to really go into pretty good kinetic theory to be able to derive um, all of that stuff. So the net result uh, of this is that this is classical diffusion and this is neoclassical diffusion. But it turns out a lot of plasmas have transport rates or diffusion coefficients much larger than this, orders of magnitude larger than this. And what we think those are due to are microscopic fluctuations, particularly produced by collective instabilities. And so what we call that, okay, is anomalous. Anomalous means we can't predict it, okay, or not well. So called anomalous diffusion. And there what you have is that the perpendicular diffusion coefficient is, again, a delta x squared over delta t. But now the delta x becomes the, uh, well, delta correlation, the turbulent decorrelation distance for the turbulence. And the delta t, the 1 over delta t, uh, becomes 1 over the uh, correlation time. And here what's going on is uh, you're getting... Uh, turbulent decorrelation of uh, turbulent flows, turbulent motion, turbulent steps, however you want to call it, motion, delta T, delta X, perp. And one particular class of that is talked about a little bit in Chen, uh, but it's since been shown is not really so relevant, and that's called Bohm diffusion. And what that is uh, is sort of the D perp uh, is, well, decorrelated at a rate uh, omega c uh, times gyro radius squared and this is uh, T over EB, and uh, 1 over 16 is a canonical number that people use, but the 1 16th um, is, in fact, uh, how can I say it? <laughs> Not a very serious factor. Uh, it was a serious factor in some previous, um, in some original, um, in some original uh, very turbulent plasmas, 
but now people do regularly orders of magnitude better than this, so people don't worry about Bohm diffusion so much anymore. We do worry about anomalous diffusion, but not necessarily Bohm diffusion. Okay, so finally, let's suppose again that I have uh, somehow calculated, succeeded in calculating some diffusion coefficient. What is the net uh, confinement time here? I just want to sort of remind you of the result we got before. The net confinement time against diffusion Well, what we found was that basically tau was uh, of the order of um, a squared over pi over 2 quantity squared times d perp. And this was for a slab model where a was the half radius of the slab. Or, and this was the sort of lowest order eigenmode, uh, a squared divided by uh, first zero of the Bessel function, 2.4048 uh, squared times d perp, and this is for a cylindrical model. And this last one becomes a squared over 5.78 d perp, 76 I guess it is, and um, this is usually approximated as a squared over 6 d perp. Or if we have the energy containment time, <coughs> excuse me, this would be, you have to add a two-thirds factor downstairs, so you get a squared over two-thirds for a, the heat capacity factor, basically, times 6 and then chi perp, and so this becomes a squared over 4 chi perp. And now, remember that we said a moment ago that if we had classical diffusion, that in fact it was chi perp ion, which was the dominant process. So in fact, uh, chi perp ion, uh, you know, was the largest diffusivity. Okay, so this would say that the classically based dominant transport process would be the energy containment of ion heat and then followed by square root of mass ratio factor 40 larger would be the particle diffusivity and the electron heat. But anyway, it turns out experimentally everything gets out at about the same rate. Uh, heat, uh, electrons, ions, uh, and uh, electron heat and ion heat. Uh, empirically, it turns out to be about that way. Okay, I'm going to uh, quit here for a moment and... Uh, Basically, this completes what I wanted to talk about on Chapter 5 and sort of Chapters 1 through 5. And since we're going to have a, um, uh, an exam next time, what I'm going to do in the last part of the time today is just review in a cursory and quick way everything we've done up until now, at least what I think we've talked about up until now. <coughs>